Now on BBC One at 9.25, the news with Michael Burke. Thousands of anti-communist demonstrators have clashed with tanks on the streets of Belgrade. Two Yugoslavs have been killed, 70 injured. And tour operators save thousands of holidays, but many Air Europe passengers are still going nowhere. Good evening. An anti-communist demonstration in the Yugoslav capital Belgrade turned into the most serious riots there in more than 40 years of Marxist rule. The government called in troops and dozens of tanks to confront tens of thousands of demonstrators. Two people were reported killed and more than 70 injured. The Serbian president, Slobodan Milosevic, went on television tonight and said the forces of chaos and madness must be fought by all legal means. In the worst violence seen in the Yugoslav capital in more than four decades of communist rule, police and demonstrators fought running battles for several hours. The trouble began when police tried to prevent a crowd estimated at 30,000 from holding a banned political rally in the city's main Republic Square. The crowd broke through a police cordon and defying tear gas, water cannon and rubber bullets went ahead with the rally. Eventually the crowd was dispersed from the square by police backed by armoured cars. But the crowd went on to protest outside other government buildings repeated their demands for the resignation of the management of Belgrade Television. Opposition parties described Belgrade Television as a tool in the hands of the ruling Socialist Party in Serbia, the largest of Yugoslavia's six republics. They accused the Socialists, formerly Communists, of using the media to help them win last December's elections. As darkness fell, tanks and armoured cars of the Yugoslav army were sent out onto the streets, and with the backing of hundreds of police, order was restored to a tense and battered city centre. Jim Fish, BBC News, Belgrade. Reports from Albania say troops and police have stormed a ship carrying people trying to escape from the country. Soldiers firing guns forced the would-be refugees off the ship in the Albanian port of Duras. Ten people are thought to have been injured. Thousands of Albanians have already fled to the Italian port of Brindisi. Despite efforts to find shelter for these refugees, conditions for them are worsening. A day of utter chaos and confusion in Brindisi, with the Italian authorities desperately trying to cope with the refugee problem that is threatening to run completely out of control. The latest arrivals pushed the figure up to over 16,000. This time, they included Albanian soldiers deserting with their arms. The Italian police, quick to spot the rifles, were fully loaded. Attention, sono carichi, eh? At the dockside, further pandemonium. Simply not enough buses to move all those clamoring to be taken to temporary shelter in nearby schools and army camps. Only then can the massive job of processing so many begin. The tension, the exhaustion, and the shortage of food has meant that every few minutes there are more casualties for the hospitals to cope with. There are so many cases of malnutrition that sick children are spilling into the corridors. For some, the ordeal is just too much. Today, the captain of the largest ship asked to go back to Albania with those who changed their minds. Permission was refused. His exit blocked. The captain of this ship is now in an impossible situation. Indeed, the entire Albanian fleet here has been impounded by the Italian authorities. Their fear is that if these ships turn for home, they could well return with thousands more refugees. But by this evening, many were still determined to turn back. Panic set in. Under the strain, something was bound to give. All survived. But for many of these refugees, there seems no end to the misery. Bill Hamilton, BBC News, Brindisi. Here, Labour's trade and industry spokesman, Gordon Brown, has made a strong personal attack on the Prime Minister. He said he was dithering and indecisive over the poll tax. In the past, Mr Major has been at pains to stress he's his own man. As he visited a children's hospice in Cambridge, 
He rejected Mrs Thatcher's suggestions in an American TV interview that her achievements were being undermined. And he dismissed a reporter's question about her veiled criticisms. No one who ever has known Mrs Thatcher would suggest that she would deal in a veiled manner with things. <laughs> <laughs> But we're carrying on and building on the policies that we had there. And uh, we've been going in a particular direction for 10 years and we'll continue going in that direction. But the Prime Minister is about to undo one legacy of the Thatcher years, the poll tax. He's given ministers three weeks to make up their minds on an alternative. At the moment, the party is seething with discussions and disagreement about what to do next. I understand cabinet heavyweights are likely to back Mr Heseltine's hybrid, a combination of a property tax and a small charge paid by everyone. But lower down the ranks of government, there's deep disquiet. Some ministers say it would be both a betrayal and politically embarrassing. And there's even speculation that some might feel so strongly they'd actually resign. Others feel it would just offend another group of voters. Well, Mr Hassan's hybrid scheme certainly is one option to look at, but that would effectively mean abolishing the community charge. Now, if we do that, we're going to alienate a whole new group of voters in the community and we could be back to where we are now in, say, four years' time. Despite Mr Major's problems, the opinion polls still put the Conservatives ahead of Labour. The Harris Observer poll taken last weekend has the Conservatives up one on last month to 47%, Labour down three to 39, and the Liberal Democrats up one to nine. But the first poll taken after the Liberal Democrats' dramatic by-election gain at Ribble Valley shows the Conservatives down 3% to 41, Labour down four to 37, and the Liberal Democrats up 5 to 16. With Mr Major apparently still popular with the voters, Labour have been directing their fire on him. The dithering, muddling and indecisive John Major, who cannot sort out the poll tax because he has long supported the poll tax, is the same John Major who cannot sort out the recession because as Chancellor his policies created the recession. With another protest march against the poll tax in Glasgow today, both opposition parties must hope that whatever replaces it will be just as unpopular. Tory MPs ruefully admit that's very much on the cards. Tour operators have been working all day to find alternative flights for holidaymakers left stranded by the grounding of Air Europe. They say they've managed to make new arrangements for thousands of passengers, but people are still being told to check with their travel agents before leaving home. At Gatwick today, most passengers who had booked holidays through the International Leisure Group were getting away, provided they were not due to fly with Air Europe. For Air Europe passengers, there was only disappointment. You bring someone in a wheelchair down here, you have to turn around and go home again. And it's diabolical. Passengers whose holiday was booked using an Air Europe charter flight were handed a letter telling them that though they couldn't fly, they could claim a refund. We don't know what to do. You know, we've got a week to leave, we've got to get to home. Do nothing. I'm really upset because I've worked for Air Europe for three and a half years. So obviously, I've not got a job anymore. And I've got a holiday as well. It was worse for those who had booked on an Air Europe scheduled flight. Some were found seats on other airlines, but others faced the prospect of no holiday and no refund. There's no recognised procedure through which they can get their money back. And they may well find that there is money lost. That's very sad. APTA has been working extremely hard for some time to get that put right, and we hope that the lessons to be learned from this particular failure will add a tremendous amount of weight to the negotiations we're having with the airlines uh, over trying to find a way around this. Today, MPs called for an extension of the bonding system, which protects package holiday makers if firms cease trading to include those buying scheduled air tickets. Several thousand passengers were booked with Air Europe this weekend. They're being advised to contact their travel agent or tour operator but there was reassurance for the 25,000 passengers already abroad. They will be brought home by other airlines. The American Secretary of State, James Baker, has paid a flying visit to Kuwait, where he met the Crown Prince, Sheikh Saad. Earlier, he had talks with the Emir of Kuwait, who's still in Saudi Arabia. The Emir says he'll return home next week. He says he'll hold elections in Kuwait when circumstances allow. Arriving in liberated Kuwait was a moment of personal satisfaction for James Baker. He did much of the diplomatic spade work to build up the coalition against Iraq and to hold it together. But now the fighting's over, he's anxious to help shape the peace. 
Amid the strictest security, the Secretary of State was flown by helicopter into Kuwait City for talks with the Crown Prince, Sheikh Saad. High on their agenda, how Kuwait should be protected in the future. The Crown Prince says no one's safe, while Saddam Hussein remains the leader of Iraq. As long uh, as Saddam uh, in power, I don't think the, uh, the whole uh, region uh, will witness any sort of uh, security and stability. The Kuwaitis are being pressed by Mr. Baker to introduce more democracy. Today he was told that elections here are not far away. I could say that uh, this policy is coming very soon. How soon? Within a year? Well, I'm not going to fix a, a date now. Mr. Baker also came here to discuss the reconstruction of Kuwait, and he's hoping American companies can win the lion's share of the contracts that will be on offer as a reward for the leading role of the United States in Kuwait's liberation. But this visit has been brief and low-key because President Bush himself is expected here in the not-too-distant future. And as one American official said, you don't upstage the boss. Ben Brown, BBC News, Kuwait. Hundreds of handicapped children were all but abandoned in Kuwait when the Iraqis invaded. Their parents and most of their doctors and nurses fled, leaving them behind. Now American troops are helping to look after them. They've lived through a nightmare, a time when the world's attention was focused on their country, but their needs were largely ignored. 800 children and young adults were left with one doctor and 17 nurses to fend for themselves. Most staff fled when the Iraqis came. Many of the children need constant care. During the occupation, there was precious little care, and according to the institute director, horrific suffering. Many people died of hunger and thirst because there was less food and much more important, no people to give them the food. American soldiers from a special unit set up to aid civilians in war zones are among the volunteers helping the children who've survived. Much of the equipment used here was stolen by the Iraqis, but the staff say the saddest part of the whole episode was the way in which the children were left alone, aware that something was wrong and that they'd been deserted. Most of the parents of the children here, they left them here in the institute and they gone outside of Kuwait to Saudi Arabia or to Egypt or to any place else, you know, because they don't care about the children here. Today, the children sing songs celebrating the Kuwaiti nation. The occupation that wrecked their lives is over, and they're cared for again. There are V signs. V for victory, but V for victim, too. Justin Webb, BBC News, Kuwait City. As more reports reach the west of anti-Saddam riots in Iraqi cities, Iraqi opposition leaders are getting together in Beirut to work out their strategy. Inside Iraq, there have been new accounts of clashes between insurgents and government forces from a group of foreign journalists who arrived in Jordan today. Forty journalists in freedom in Jordan after being taken by the Iraqis in the southern city of Basra are now able to report freely what they saw. The situation in Basra is very confused. We left Basra on Thursday and there was still uh, bombing and uh, shelling. Uh, they bombed uh, the civilian uh, cities with the Katusha and with uh, tank shells. Reports today from opposition groups outside Iraq speak of more general rebellion beyond Basra and the Kurdish area in the north where Suleymaniyah is now a Kurdish rebel command centre. There's one Iranian report, although it must be just a guess, of 30,000 dead in the fighting in the south. A huge oil fire in Basra is said to be visible from Iran and mustard gas is reported to have been used in four towns including Basra. Mr. Baker has warned Iraq about the use of chemical weapons, although it's unclear what America can do about it. Well, we had reason to believe that they might uh, be planning such uh, activity, and we thought it was important uh, that we let them know how we would view that. Iraqi opposition leaders met the Foreign Office Minister Douglas Hogg this week. He's going to the Gulf himself tomorrow. The leaders of 30 Iraqi opposition groups are now gathering in Beirut to plan a joint strategy buoyed up by claims that Saddam Hussein's army is on the run. The army is demoralized. The attacks uh, has been supported by the uh, population of uh, Suleimania. 
and also the uh, pro-government militia have joined the Kurdish forces. Also, there are uh, large numbers of uh, defections to the uh, Kurdish side from the Iraqi army. The new fighting is more turmoil for a country still recovering from weeks of bombing with Saddam Hussein still apparently in power. In South Africa, ten people have died in violence between rival black factions in the township of Alexandra near Johannesburg. Thirty people were wounded. Township civil war has broken out again, this time in Alexandra, one of Johannesburg's most deprived black areas. Hundreds of police and troops moved in to separate rival gangs backing Nelson Mandela's ANC or Zulu chief Butelezi's in Carter. The security forces seized weapons from both sides. However, today's fighting started, a Zulu man was necklaced by ANC supporters, burned to death with a petrol-soaked car tire, and Zulus seized ANC followers and beat and hacked them to death. Six weeks after joint calls for peace from Nelson Mandela and chief Butelezi, the bitter hostility between their followers has not yet been overcome. More than 4,000 people have died in warfare between South Africa's two largest political groups in the past five years, warfare intensified by the prospect of future majority rule. Two days ago, Chief Butelezi apologized to Nelson Mandela and South Africa for Inkata violence and challenged Mr Mandela to respond on behalf of the ANC. James Robbins, BBC News, Johannesburg. Now with news of today's sport, here's Rob Bonnet. Ronnie Moran has achieved his first win in charge of Liverpool and broken a sequence of three consecutive defeats. His side won their first division match at Manchester City by three goals to nil, with Jan Mulby scoring two penalties, both controversially awarded. And Jeff Thomas scored twice in a minute for Crystal Palace in their win over Southampton. So at the top, Liverpool stay second behind Arsenal, but only on goal difference. Leeds beat Coventry 2-0, and Chelsea go eighth after a 3-2 win over Manchester United. Wimbledon didn't play. At the bottom, Aston Villa lost at home to Luton. QPR and Derby didn't play, but Sunderland lost at home to Sheffield United, who move out of the bottom five for the first time. It was also FA Cup's sixth round day in England. Both of today's matches between Arsenal and Cambridge United and Norwich and Nottingham Forest will be shown on Match of the Day after this news. Now, look away if you don't want to know the results. In the Scottish Premier Division, Mark Walters scored the winner for Rangers in their 2-1 win over Hearts and extended their lead at the top to six points. Aberdeen didn't play, Dundee United won at St Mirren, Celtic won at Hibernian. Witness are through to the semi-finals of Rugby League Silk Cut Challenge Cup. In a match that produced six tries, they beat Warrington by 26 points to 14. Bidding for a League and Cup double and revenge for a Regal Trophy defeat earlier this season, Witness offered another demonstration of their imported forward power. First, their Kiwi prop is seen by Marlow, created the chance for David Hume to score the game's opening try. Then, after half-time, the Tongan Kolotos showed the sort of pace more usually associated with a centre than a 16-stone forward, and Witness had carved out a decisive lead. 16-2 down, Warrington had to take risks if they were to have a chance. Instead, Currier intercepted O'Sullivan's pass and put the result beyond doubt. All the Witness fans could now want was a score from Martin O'Fire. Oh, to O'Fire! Now then! Oh, just look at this! Mercer has no chance! Here is the perfect athlete in motion! Warrington managed two late tries, the second of which came from Tony Thornley, salvaging pride, if not a place in the semi-finals. Witness through to the last four by 26 points to 14. Wasps have opened up English Rugby Union's Courage Championship by beating the leaders, Bath, by 16 points to 15. With less than five minutes to go, Bath appeared to have preserved their unbeaten record when their powerful pack enabled England scrum half Richard Hill to touch down. But in injury time, Wasps took the points with the best move of the match. Rigby's acceleration opened a gap and a switch move sent Fran Clough on a race to the line. Edit. Tonight's main news again. 
Dozens of tanks are tonight surrounding the parliament building and the television station in the centre of Belgrade. Earlier, two Yugoslavs were killed when tens of thousands of demonstrators clashed with police. That's all from the newsroom. Good night. <laughs>